we're going into a totally different phase of space. First time it was about two superpowers trying to prove their technological prowess, and they set the moon as their objective. And then we realize there's a lot in space that we can actually utilize. The oxygen that you need, the propellant, the bricks to build a home are already there. You don't have to bring it from Earth. That's the value of resources. The living of the land concept is the one that we're searching for right now. That is going to enable more exploration, allow us to travel further. It has been realized not just by our own space agency, but by dozens of space agencies around the world, by companies that they see an opportunity here to get involved. And when you get the whole world behind something like this, you know that it's time to go. The moon is shaping up to be a critical destination in the 2020s. The big vision? Establish it as a celestial boom town, where new technologies can be tested and the moon's raw materials can be harnessed to power future missions. Space resources is anything that you can use beyond Earth. It could be solar power, microgravity, it could be vacuum in space, or it could be something more concrete like metals and minerals and gases and water on the moon. And in fact, the very first resource we utilized from space was just the view from above. The ability to look at Earth has given us weather forecasting, global communications, GPS systems, the ability to look at the effects that we're causing on Earth. Angel Abud Madrid has been focused on the potential of space resources for decades. He's watched political objectives switch targets from the moon to Mars and asteroids, and then back to the moon. No matter the target, for Onhill, space resources are key if we want to explore further. And the moon is the ultimate proving ground. Nothing beats the moon. You can see it every night. The rest are just dots up in the dark sky. This is a place that is close, a place where we can test systems. Now that the space industry is a $350 billion industrial juggernaut with new startups and commercial initiatives racing to land on the lunar surface, Onhill launched the world's first graduate program on space resources to prepare the next generation. Obviously, young people feel that this is their time. This is their moon, and they want to be part of it. We're definitely not just focused on the technology because engineers get really excited about developing things. There is the technological, the scientific, the economic, the legal, even the psychological aspects of a new phase in space. This new pivot is not about extracting resources and bringing them back to Earth. It's about creating a new manufacturing pipeline off-world. Every little bolt, every little nut, all the human consumables, all the propellants have come from Earth, and that is extremely expensive. You look at any rocket, 90% of that rocket is fuel. To launch the little tiny 10% that could be a satellite, could be a capsule with humans. And so that's not a, a sustainable way to explore. It's gonna limit us to what we can do. That is why one of the most important resources that we're gonna go after is what can help us to make propellant in space. Ask any space resources expert and they'll likely tell you that water is the oil of space. Back in 2009, NASA slammed a used rocket tank near the moon's south pole, confirming the presence of water ice and other volatiles in these permanently shadowed regions. If you can recover the water, you can convert it into breathable oxygen for astronauts or split it into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. There's the idea of using the moon as a refueling station, so you don't need to carry as much fuel from Earth to get out of Earth's atmosphere and gravity well. Launch to the moon, refuel at the moon, and then launch somewhere deeper in space like Mars. It is totally science fiction in reality. But before we can build a lunar propellant depot, there's a tremendous amount of work ahead. There's three things that we have to have in mind in order to extract resources from any other planet. First of all, you have to know the resource that you're going to extract. Then you have to know exactly if it's ice on the surface, if it's snow, is it dirty ice, is it below the surface? Is it combined with the soil? We need to get down there and, and see what's happening. NASA is planning to send a golf cart-sized rover to the moon for a prospecting mission, dubbed VIPER. VIPER stands for Volatile Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. So it's kind of a mouthful, but that really describes what it does. It's meant for the polar regions. It's meant to drive all around for miles and miles, taking samples of what's there. At the helm of Viper's drilling operations is Honey Bee Robotics. They're veteran drill experts and roboticists who've developed this planetary drill. 
In true space biz fashion, it's got an acronym too, TRIDENT, or the regolith and ice drill for exploration of new terrains. The TRIDENT drill has been in development for almost two decades. The idea is that it's a rotary percussive drill, that means it rotates and hammers down to one meter. It takes little bites of the ground and it pulls up the sample and then the NASA instruments are going to look for water or any other volatiles that come out of the soil. It's very small and compact. It has to be super dust tolerant. The moon is known for being very difficult with dust. Pipe is going to last a couple of lunar days, which means that it needs to survive the lunar night. So it needs to be low power, it needs to be light mass, it needs to never get stuck. Once it's in space, it's in space. You can't go out and just fix it. It just has to work and work for a really, really long time. We do a lot of testing here. We take them to the farthest reaches of the Earth just to make sure they'll last. Through all of the testing we've done to date, we have not been able to get this drill stuck, even when we've tried to. NASA talks about technology readiness level, or TRL. TRL-6 is sort of the cusp of when something is ready to be developed for flight. So that's where we're at right now. All the prospecting, the phase, technology demonstration will have to be undertaken by robots. It's the cost and the extreme environment that you're going to be facing. Right now, the cost to send a uh, kilogram to low Earth orbit is about $4,000, $35,000 to put it on the surface of the moon. Multiply that by 10 or by 50 to have humans. You're looking at a place with radiation. You're looking at a place that is dark, that lacks communications. So why send a human to do that the job first? Send some, some, somebody else. And that somebody else is a rover that can tell us, okay, this is what I found. Once we've prospected and know more about the water ice, step two and three in this future lunar depot plan come into play. Now you know the resources now, do you have the technology to recover under any environment that you're gonna be dealing with. Within the first 10 years, you'll see some of the technologies to prove how you can extract them. And third, you have to have a customer. As important as science and technology and knowing your resources and how you're going to extract them is everything that comes around it. Some of the companies that are trying to get involved in this, they're asking those questions. Can I actually extract them? Is anybody interested? And is this legal? I don't want to touch it if the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 tells me that no country can own any piece of celestial land. You cannot own the moon, you cannot own asteroids. That's been signed by more than 100 countries. And so how am I gonna extract the resource? Well, is there a way that without owning that object, the moon or an asteroid, can I claim a certain space, be there for a couple of years, extract whatever I have to do and then leave? As of January 2020, only the United States and Luxembourg have passed laws that allow commercial companies to extract resources. But at some point, we have to agree on this. And so that has pushed efforts to bring together countries to talk about it. This is an important conversation that we're going to have to have because there's some attachment to the moon. All civilizations have looked at the moon in different ways. They see it as a place where some people have religious connection to it or philosophical connections or just the beauty of it. And so we're going to have to agree on what's doable and what's not. Now that we have the vision, what will lunar robots look like in the future? And how exactly are scientists going to turn the moon's billion-year-old water into rocket fuel? Check out the second part to find out.